as you guys are seated, if you'll go ahead and dig your copy of God's Word out and meet me in John chapter 4. I feel like that's the place that God has an assignment laid out for us to receive tonight. John chapter 4. Man, I'm ready to teach the Word of God tonight. I know it seems like Wednesdays go by really fast for me. I don't know about y'all, but it seems like we almost get done with one and the other one's already coming back around, but it never gets old to me. And I'm super excited about the Word that God has laid out for us tonight. Monday, as you know, was Labor Day. Me and my wife Ashley and our son Graham enjoyed the day off at the lake with family and friends. But I was reminded while we were out there of Jesus' words in Matthew when he was speaking to his disciples. And he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord to send out laborers. Monday, we took a day off from labor, or at least most of us got to. But Monday is gone. Wednesday is here, and I'm ready to do work for Jesus tonight. The series is Combos with Christ. Jesus taught some amazing things and performed some amazing miracles on a large scale throughout the course of his ministry. But what we've been seeing is that some of the greatest works he did and some of the greatest teachings that he shared took place in quiet, secluded, one-on-one conversations and interactions with people, and we encounter another one Tonight, tell someone next to you, Jesus wants to talk with you. Come on, you got to tell them. They may not be listening. They may not even know you came into this place tonight because Jesus wants to talk with you. And as he transitions, as he transitions from city to city, we find Jesus tired and fatigued and worn out from his journeying. So he sits down beside a well and he strikes up a conversation with a local woman who walks out there to draw water, and we pick up the narrative in John chapter 4, starting in verse 4, the Word of God reads, And he had to pass through Samaria. And so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour, or noon, in the middle of the day. Verse 7, A woman from Samaria came to draw Water And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. This week I want to talk to you from the subject of the water cooler effect. In most places of business, you would find somewhere in that establishment a water cooler that looks a lot like this one. And most of the time they're going to be found in common areas or near the break Room And most of you know the scene, right? Especially if we have any office fans, any office fans in the building of the night. Most of you know the scene of what takes place around the water cooler in workplaces, right? It's it's a place for people to gather, to have conversations, to take a break from the mundane task of getting your job done that day. is to walk out into a common area, walk out into the break room and gather around the water cooler and just let your mind have a break. And have conversation, to socialize with other people, to joke around, to... Make small talk. They talk about the weather. They talk about their weekend. They talk about the game last night. All these different things, all these different conversations that take place around the water cooler. And most of the time it's portrayed as pointless babble that doesn't really accomplish anything. But people began to do studies concerning the conversations that were taking place around these coolers, and they found a correlation. These cooler conversations were impacting in a positive way the work of each of these individuals. And they identified four aspects as to why it was having such a positive impact upon their work and upon what they did for a living, and those collectively come together to be known as the water cooler effect. And the first one of those aspects that we see tonight is connection. Studies found that people were connecting with each other around the water cooler. They were engaging one another and Though it might start out as small talk at first, what they found was that as they continued to engage each other in socializing, in conversation, that small talk gradually began to move from something as insignificant or a surface level as the weather or the game or what you did this weekend into something a lot more personal and a lot more involved with the intimate details of their life and what they were dealing with. Go back to the story with me with Jesus. Verse 7 again, a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? 
For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him. He would have given you living water. So here we have Jesus, tired as he was from journeying, sits down beside a well when this woman shows up, and they engage in what I'm designating as the first ever water cooler conversation. It just looks a little bit different. It's not as nice, it's not as put together, it's not as eccentric as this machine. It's just a couple of rocks and a circle on the ground with a bucket over it and a rope that goes down to pick up water. Same concept, though. This is the first ever water cooler conversation that Jesus is having with this woman who walks out to draw water. She walks up and begins to draw water out of the well, and Jesus says to her, Hey, do you mind if I have a drink? And so instantly what we see is connection. Jesus is making a connection with this woman. Jesus is engaging this woman in a conversation. She can't even believe that Jesus is talking to her. Go back and look at verse 9. And what she said, Jesus says, Can I have a drink? And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me? A Samaritan woman. What you have to understand about cultural context in that time is that the Jews hated Samaritans. If they could avoid any and all association with them, that's what they would do. They couldn't stand each other, man. It's like getting an Alabama and an Auburn fan in the same room together and multiply that by like a thousand. They couldn't stand to be in the same place with each other. As a matter of fact, the Jews so hated the Samaritans that they labeled them as dogs. They were unclean. They were nasty. You didn't get around Samaritans. You didn't associate with Samaritans. And you sure didn't ask if you could take a drink from one of their cups. Dogs. If you wanted to have a cut down back in Jesus' time to one of your Jewish buddies, you would call one of them a Samaritan. That's how bad they hated each other. And on top of all that, you especially wouldn't see a man engaging a woman in conversation. What Jesus is doing here, quite honestly, is outrageous for the culture and the social norm of his time. Complete lunacy. Can I tell you something tonight? Jesus will crash through and utterly tear down social, traditional, ethnical, and cultural barriers for the sake of saving a lost soul. The fact is, Jesus traveled to this well because he knew this specific woman would be there. And it was his purpose, yes, even his desire to connect with and engage her. Not to just make small talk about her life. Not just to ask her, hey, what about this weather? Not just to say, did you catch the game last night? Not just to inquire about her family or who she was but a purposeful mission to save her soul. This reviews, reveals the pursuing heart of our Savior. Who, by the way, said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. There isn't a person here tonight that he doesn't want to connect with and engage in the same love now. I hope y'all are in it from the get-go tonight. Because I don't want you to miss it. There is no warming up, getting to like the second or third point, and that's really when it's going to get good. It's already good. There isn't a person here tonight that he doesn't want to connect with and engage in that same love now. And we get excited, don't we, David, as Christians? We're like, that's it, pastor. Give them that. Give them that Jesus stuff. That's what I'm talking about. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He cares for you. We get all rah-rah and hoopla over all this other stuff and give them all that good stuff about love and forgiveness of sins and Jesus connecting and engaging with this person. It is great. It is amazing. It is awesome. But let me ask those of you that are already following Jesus in this room tonight, because I got convicted of this personally myself. When was the last time you intentionally tried to connect with a Samaritan? When was the last time you intentionally tried to connect with somebody who looked different than you? When was the last time you intentionally tried to connect with someone who talked different than you? Who had a different skin color? Who had a different upbringing? Who comes from a different background? When was the last time you tried to connect with somebody that was completely different to you, that didn't have any of the same interest as you did for the sake of showing them the love of Jesus. You see, we can't cheer on the love of Jesus if we're not also going to champion the love of Jesus.
Jesus made a connection with this woman. We need to be doing the same thing. Those of us that have been called according to his purpose and have been redeemed by his blood. Jesus makes a connection with this woman. But the water cooler effect, let's, let's go back to it. The second aspect of this effect, the study found, occurs naturally out of the first one. And so what they found was that as people began to connect around the water cooler, they also began sharing. Sharing in specific tactics and tips and knowledge and information about their job, things that they had encountered, successes that they had found in the course of doing their job. They began to share that with their other employees for their benefit as well. So connection leads to sharing. Let's go back to the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well. Pick back up in verse 11 with me. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty after to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. In the same sense, after Jesus makes a connection with this woman and engages her in this conversation, he begins to share with her about living water. Explaining that whoever drinks of this well again will have to come back over and over and over because you're only going to be thirsty over and over and over again. But whoever drinks of the water that he gives will never thirst Again, Jesus speaking metaphorically here reveals that nothing physical can bring complete fulfillment or satisfaction. There is no amount of wealth. There is no amount of possessions, achievements, degrees, promotions, popularity, or social status that will satisfy. You will always desire more. Always. Listen to me. I would spare you a lot of trouble and heartache in your young lives of pursuing things that will never fulfill or satisfy if you will listen to this one thing. The temporal can never satisfy in a way that is eternal. Whether you've chosen to acknowledge it or not, there is a spiritual thirst within all of us that was placed there by God that we might desire and long to know Him that can only be quenched by Jesus. Only Him and the living water that He gives. And I, don't know, I won't stand here on some pedestal before you guys and act like I'm perfect, not like I've got it all put together, not like I don't ever have a struggle in my life. I would be lying if I stood here and told you that I don't ever get off at track sometimes and start envying or desiring some physical, temporal things. I would love to have a bigger house. Ask my wife. We would, we would much rather have a bigger house now that, that Graham's there. I mean, look, 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 as small as he is, as small as it, the house ain't big enough anymore. And it's getting shorter and shorter because he started crawling, and now we're all over the place. So we need a bigger house. It, when y'all leave tonight, go out here in the parking lot and find the jankiest white F-150 sitting out there with paint chipped off of it, with the, with the bug deflectors and the, and the weather guards half peeled off on the windows, that's mine. There's a, a good possibility when I get ready to leave tonight, I might not be able to. I never know what's going to happen. I'm not going to stand here and act like I wouldn't desire a nicer truck to go along with a nicer house. But when it comes down to it, only Jesus satisfies and fulfills the longings of my heart. 
Paul understood this as well as anybody. In Philippians 4.11, he says, I've learned that in whatever situation I'm to be content or to be satisfied. Men and women of God in this room tonight, you're struggling. You've got a bad taste in your mouth. You're going through some ups and downs. You feel like you're disconnected with God. Well, it's because you keep drinking from the wrong well. And I know there are plenty of you in this room tonight that have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So let me ask you, if you've got purified living water from the Savior, why do you keep going back to the mud holes of the world? But I ask myself that question all the time. Only Jesus can fulfill, only Jesus can satisfy your thirst and your longing in a spiritual sense. Nothing else And nobody else can do that. And so now at this point, Jesus talking about all this living water stuff and never having to thirst again. This woman begins to pick up what Jesus is putting down. She's like, I want some of this. And she asked Jesus for it. So where can I get this water? I don't have to keep coming back out here to the well to draw water. See, she still doesn't get it. She's still locked in on the physical. Some of you need to get off the physical stuff tonight and realize that God's trying to do a spiritual work in your life to set you free from some things. Where can I get this water? And so Jesus, in a loving and patient way, continues to explain to her and share with her how can she receive it. And it starts with acknowledging and confessing sin. I'm going to talk about sin for a little bit. Because y'all's generation, unfortunately, has a lot of pampered pastors out there that don't want to address the icky stuff of our lives. And sin is one of those things. Sin is one of those things. Every single one of us, the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus makes this woman admit her sin. He says, I'll tell you how you can get it, but first go and get your husband and bring him back. She says, well, I don't have a husband. I don't know if you realize it or not, but that was the shortest remark she made in the entire conversation. Why? Because when you start bringing conviction into somebody's life, when you start talking about their sin, we don't want nothing to do with that anymore. But Jesus makes this woman acknowledge and confess her sin. Go and get your husband. And she acknowledges, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right, you've had five. And the one that you're with now isn't your husband. But y'all are living together, aren't you? What you have said is true. She doesn't try to run from it. She doesn't try to hide it. She doesn't try to conceal it. She acknowledges and confesses her sin right there before the Savior of the world, and she doesn't even know who she's talking to. Listen to me. There are some hearts in this room tonight that Jesus is desperately trying to save from an eternity in hell, but there is no conversion without conviction. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You you cannot fully appreciate the beauty of the cross without realizing the ugliness of sin. You get living water the moment you acknowledge that you are a sinner and you need salvation. Jesus is sharing with hearts in this room tonight how you can receive living water. And it's quite simple. Just like this woman, all you got to do is ask for it. But you also have to be willing to acknowledge something as well. Back to the water cooler. Can't get off this thing. The third aspect of the water cooler effect, the study identified, is that it once again comes as a result of the first and second aspects. As people began to gather around the cooler, they began to connect with each other and they began to share tips, tactics, information, successes, which then leads to enhancement. Specifically of their work-life balance. So as employees began to connect and they began to share ways that benefit their coworkers. Well, now we have an opportunity in front of us for everybody to start doing their job on a better level, which then allows them to more evenly balance out the time that they spend at work along with the time they spend with family, which is an important thing. Verse 25, back to the conversation between Jesus and this woman. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. 
Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? As the conversation continues, Jesus identifies himself to this woman as the Savior of the world. At that moment, she placed her faith in Jesus for the salvation of her soul. That very moment. That word enhance. To enhance means to raise to a higher degree. To raise to a higher degree. That's what Jesus does when we place our faith in him. He raises our life to a higher degree than we could have ever gotten to on our own. John 10, 10, Jesus says, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. This woman had been through five marriages and was living with another man now. She was such an outcast that she waited until 12 o'clock, high noon, to go and fetch water for herself and for her family. You know what everybody else in the town went early that morning during the cool of the day? But she was such an outcast. She had been so ostracized by her peers that she was so full of shame and guilt. She didn't want to go out there at the same time as everybody else because she had a reputation for being that girl. And so she said, I would rather wait until it's the hottest part of the day. And I'm 100% convinced that nobody else will be there at that well so I don't have to encounter anybody. No doubt she was thought to be a tramp. No doubt she was thought to be a failure. No doubt she was thought to be a nobody. No doubt she was full of guilt, shame, and embarrassment. But after she encountered Jesus, I'll say that again. After she encountered Jesus and placed her faith in Him, she went back as a daughter of the King, as a co-heir with Christ, as a chosen vessel to display His love. She went back full of joy inexpressible, hope immeasurable, and peace unsurpassable because of Jesus, her life had been advanced. He raised it to a degree she never even thought was imaginable. How many of you here tonight are thankful for the enhancement of eternal life and being made new through Jesus Christ and His intervention in your life? Man, I'm so thankful as a 10-year-old little kid like this woman and Jesus, who had to pass through Samaria. So thankful as a 10-year-old kid, Jesus had to pass through my bedroom to make me realize that I needed living water. That I was a sinner in need of a Savior. None of us can probably even begin to imagine the weight of all this woman had carried throughout her life. I don't know what happened to her marriages. I don't know if she blew them. I don't know if her husbands blew them. I don't know if they died. We don't know what happened. But when you don't know the details of something, human nature is automatically to just make up your own. And I guarantee you that's what people did about her. And to think about how her life changed. She ran back to the town that she was trying to avoid at the well. That's the kind of work Jesus does in your life. That's the kind of enhancement that He brings into your life. He will do such an amazing transformative work that you will no longer care about what's been said and you would much rather go back and tell somebody about the change that's taking place. I don't care if you know who I was as long as you let me tell you who I am. She runs back and she begins to tell the town about all this stuff that she had encountered at the well, about this man named Jesus who had set her free from her sins and wiped away her past and made her into a new creation. And it leads us back to the water cooler effect one more time. I promise it's going to make sense. Perhaps the most striking aspect of this effect is the result of all three aspects working together. The study found that as people get together around the water cooler and they connect and they engage each other in conversation, they begin to share things with each other, which leads to an enhanced life between work and leisure. Which then increases productivity. Listen, by an astounding 10 to 15 percent. That may seem like a small number, but if we had any business owners in this room tonight, there's not a single one of them that wouldn't like to see a 10 to 15 percent increase 
in their company. It increases their productivity. Workers were accomplishing more. They were achieving greater goals. Their companies were growing. Go back in verse 30. We've got to find out what happens at the end of all this. This woman runs back into town, and she's telling all the people, and it says that they went out of the town and were coming to him, being Jesus. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said, Am I have food to eat you don't know anything about? So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who weeps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Don't, don't ever think that your testimony is insignificant. Because I'm just going to tell you guys, many people might not have believed her. She would have kept her mouth shut about the things Jesus did in her life. She goes and testifies. Many people believe. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This woman goes back to town and begins telling all these people about Jesus and what he has done in her life. And as a result, they came to see for themselves. And the Word tells us that many more believed. I want you to, I want you to see something with me as we finish up tonight. Don't quit on me yet. We're at the finish line. But I need you to see this as we finish up tonight. Put all of this in the context of the church. Put all this in the context of the church. I need some help. I need some volunteers. And don't get nervous. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. I just, I, I need some help. So, Andrew, do you mind? Can you help me out? Come up here for a minute. Come on, Julie, Peyton, help me out. Come on, Harrison, help me out. Who else, who else, who else? Let's go to this side. You got me out of this side. Nervous, nervous, nervous. Everybody's nervous. Everybody. Come on, Brantley. Help me out. Help me out. Imagine this within the context of the church. This is a place where we gather. So we're around the water cooler, right? You guys are hanging out and you're having small talk and you're connecting with each other. And you're engaging in each other's life. This is what we do. This is why God ordained the church and why he brought us together as a group of believers. You guys are gathered together within this context and you're connecting and you're engaging. You're involved in each other's life. And the cool thing is you're all studying the word of God. And so as that's happening, when you get together within this place, you begin sharing with each other about what God has been speaking into your life through his word. And because of that, now you're encouraging one another. Because Andrew tells Julie, and Julie tells Peyton about what God's been doing in their life and what they've been seeing in his word. And the same thing with Brantley and Harrison. Brantley begins to encourage Harrison because he's down and he's discouraged and he's frustrated. But Brantley read in the word the other day that our God never leaves us or forsakes us, so he encourages him with that. And so now we've connected, and now we're sharing, and now our lives are enhanced by the encouragement that we've received from other brothers and sisters in Christ. And so what do we do with that? Well, we increase production because of what we experienced and because of the impact it's had on our lives. Everybody goes and gets somebody else. Go find one other person. Go find one other person. Go find one other person. And just like the woman of Samaria goes and finds somebody and brings them back with it. The same thing happens within the body of Christ. Everybody gets encouraged. We connect. We share. We enhance each other's lives. Productivity says, i got to test somebody. So we grab somebody and bring them back with them. Now all of a sudden we've doubled. And the same thing begins to happen week after week. We come back together. We connect with each other. We share about the things God has been teaching us in His Word. We encourage and we enhance each other's lives. And the next thing you know, we get so full of the Spirit, we got to tell somebody else about it. Hey, come, come to church with me. i got to show you somebody who told me everything I ever did. i got to show you somebody who transformed my life for forever. You guys can sit down. You don't have to go and grab anybody else. You get the picture. We connect. We share. We enhance. We produce. It's not just the water cooler effect. It's the way Christ affects. When you connect with Him, 
he begins to share living water. When he raises your life to a higher degree than you ever thought imaginable, then the automatic result should be to go back into town and say, y'all got to see this. You won't imagine what has happened. You can't imagine what's happened. I don't know how to explain it. But I can take you to the one who did it. Jesus is connecting in the room tonight. Jesus is sharing with hearts in the room tonight. Living water is available for each and every person here that has not yet tasted of it. Salvation has been made available for each and every person in this room tonight that has not yet received it. All you got to do is ask. Jesus says, I will give it freely. Don't walk out of here tonight without getting a drink. Hey, this is Trey Mitchell, college and young adult pastor. I just wanted to say thank you for listening. It's our prayer that God uses these messages in a way that challenge and encourage you to live for His glory. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus as your Savior, we would love to help you with making that decision. Just reach out to us through our webpage at underwoodbaptist.org. Be sure to check back in with us next week as we again encounter God through His Word here at Life.